Hello everyone and welcome to my uh, lectures on network systems. This is uh, chapter six. Today's topic is the Laplacian matrix. Uh, a great pleasure to be here. So let's uh, uh, review um, where we are and what is the content of this, uh, of this chapter. So we have studied in previous chapters, we've studied, for example, a continuous time Pardon me, a discrete time dynamical system of this form. It's an averaging system in discrete time. And we've, we've seen how A can be interpreted as the adjacency matrix uh, of, a, of a weighted directed graph. And um, we perform the convergence analysis for a two consensus. So now it's time to begin um, to switch gear and talk about a different matrix that arises uh, from uh, um, uh, directed and undirected weighted graphs. And the matrix of interest is called the Laplacian matrix. We will see how it can be defined from the adjacency matrix. We will see how um, it can be used some very simple examples of applications, some useful calculations just to relate this new object to some old quantities we've already studied. And then we will look at a couple of examples from the engineers in the audience arising from um, mechanical and electrical circuits, mechanical networks, uh, spring networks and, and electric circuits. Um, and then after that, we will, we will review some properties um, of Laplacian matrices. And, and specifically, we will be interested in, in spectral properties, which have to do with eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and, and so forth. We will see that the Laplacian uh, eigenvalues live on the right half plane, plus the, the origin. And then after that, we will, we will look at the special case of symmetric Laplacian matrices. Let me just refer to them as Laplacians for now. And you will see that many things simplify and, and the treatment becomes more um, detailed. Uh, there are objects that can be defined in the symmetric case that cannot be defined in the asymmetric case. And we will study, for example, something called the algebraic connectivity of the undirected graph. If, if the matrix is symmetric, clearly the graph is undirected. We will study something called Laplacian let me write that down. So we will study the algebraic connectivity. We will also study something that I'll refer to as Laplacian systems. Laplacian system. And, and really this will be equilibrium problems. So this will be, if, if you want to uh, allow me, I may use the word static or equilibrium Laplacian systems, and we will study dynamical uh, systems defined by the Laplacian, also called the Laplacian flow dynamics. We will study that in the next uh, in the next chapter. Um, we, another example, we'll also talk about something called effective resistance, which is uh, which is a distance function on on an undirected weighted graph. Finally, in this chapter, I will quickly review. I have included two appendices. The first appendix is for, is for network scientists in the audience who are interested in a problem called community detection. Right, in community detection, you're given a graph and you wish to design an efficient algorithm that can handle very large graphs uh, and be able to uh, quickly determine um, whether the graph has a structure of communities, if it is possible to partition the graph into, into groups of nodes that have affinity in some sense and that are um, tightly connected groups that are weakly connected among, among themselves. And the second appendix is one that has to do with the design, with the control design problem. So this is a, a proportional integral control design for clock synchronization. I'll write just sync. Well, well, let's just write it out. Synchronization 
So this is a problem where you will you have a collection of heterogeneous clocks that have different that that are measure, currently measuring uh, distinct times need to be synchronized. The controller needs to be designed, and they have different speed. Perhaps they move the, the measure time at a different rate, um, and and therefore a proportional controller can be designed. And but then uh, using a, a classic control theoretic concept, a control a proportional controller is not sufficient, and one needs to design an integral control. So it's a it's a case study. Both of these are case studies one intended for a network scientist in the audience, the other for a control engineer, uh, that show how all of the tools we, we have defined so far, especially adjacency matrices and Laplace matrices, come into play as one tries to answer network scientific or, or control engineering questions. This concludes my outline of the chapter. All right, I'm now ready to um, begin the study of the Laplacian matrix associated to a uh, directed and undirected graph. So here is the first definition and it's very simple. You are given a graph G and you're given uh, its uh, uh, weighted adjacency matrix A, not symmetric in general. Recall the definition of the out degree matrix, which is the diagonal matrix constructed by computing all of the row sums of A. With this uh, definition, the, with these recollections, the Laplacian matrix associated to the digraph G is given in this equation. It's the subtraction, it's D out minus A. The matrix of out degrees minus the adjacency matrix. Now, if you want to think about it in coordinates, what you could do is you could let Lij, lowercase Lij, denote the entries of the matrix A, and Aij denote the entries of the matrix A. Now, with this notation, it is true that Lij, whenever I is different from J, so for the off-diagonal entries, it's just minus the adjacency entries. And that, of course, is because the out degree matrix is symmetric, right? And instead, if one is uh, uh, looking at the diagonal entries, when i is equal to j, then you have to sum two terms. One term is coming from the out degree matrix, and the other is the diagonal entry of a. Now, the out degree entry would be, would be the sum, the ith diagonal entry of d out is the sum under h, of a i h where h runs from 1 through n from that i need to subtract a i i because i'm subtracting the adjacency matrix in defining the laplacian therefore i obtain this final expression right here which i am going to highlight at this moment and that is the sum of all entries on the i th row except for the diagonal entry now, if the graph is undirected, these formulas immediately simplify because, uh, pardon me, if it's undirected and unweighted, because the weights are equal to plus one, and therefore the off-diagonal entries of the Laplacian is minus one, precisely when ij is an edge, um, it's zero when ij is not an edge, and when i is equal to j, in, in uh, undirected graphs perhaps we have no self-loops, and we're, uh, we're counting for each node the number of neighbors with which the node is connected, and that's the degree of the node, and that's what appears precisely in the um, diagonal entry of L. Perfect. Let me give you two simple examples. The first example is um, a simple graph. We've already seen this weighted directed graph example in the in, in chapter all the way to back to chapter three. I have five nodes. I have edges with you know randomly selected without any particular meaning edges. And um, in this particular case, um, you compute all of the. Okay, let's uh, let's clean up the image and and do it more more thoughtfully. Uh, look at all of the edges that are coming out of node one. There is an edge of weight uh, 3.7 that goes to node 2. And sure enough, I need to put minus 3.7 on the 1, 2 entry. That's because we're looking at the edge from 1 to 2. Then there is a weight 1.2 from 2 to 4. So then second, uh, um, second row, 
fourth column, 1.2 with a minus sign, and so on and so forth. So all of the off-diagonal entries are either zero if no edge is present, or minus the weight of the edge if the edge is present. Let's do it uh, conversely here, 4.4. This is the entry 5.1, so that's the edge that goes from node 5 all the way back to node 1 in my image, and it's 4.4 is the weight. The next uh, uh, items is how do I uh, compute the diagonal entries uh, of, of this matrix? And once again, they are the, the out degree of the node minus the self weight. So, for example, if you look at uh, node 4, node 4 has no outgoing edge, and therefore the entry on the matrix is indeed a zero. Let us now look at node 5. Node 5 has has an outgoing edge to node 4, which is 2.7. And then there's another outgoing edge, which we just talked about, which is 4.4. Um, there is a self loop, also of weight 4.4 by, by chance here, but this number does not matter as I am computing the diagonal entries of the Laplacian. And so, you know, 2.7 floor 4, you get exactly 7.1. All right, here's the second example. Let's talk about the complete graph. If you remember, the complete undirected graph is a graph that, let me draw the one for four nodes, where every possible edge exists except for the self loops. We've seen, maybe let's, uh, we've seen two things. We've seen that uh, the complete graph is denoted by the symbol K sub N. So here I'm writing the adjacency matrix of the complete graph. And we have seen that this was uh, of this form. So it's the vector of ones times times itself minus one n. And the reason the reason is that essentially this is a matrix where um, where you have zeros on the main diagonal and then you have ones everywhere else, right? You have you've ones on every other node. And so the matrix uh, one one n transpose, the rank one matrix one one n transpose puts ones everywhere and then you need to subtract them from the main diagonal. Perfect. So now it's also easy to see that if you take this adjacency matrix and complete all of the row sums, you get n minus 1 for each row, so which means n minus 1 times 1n. One now we're ready to do this difficult calculation of computing the Laplacian of the complete graph. Well, let me do it, let me do it, um, let me, it's already done here, so let me emphasize that. So the Laplacian, let's read this equation together. It works like this, the Laplacian is equal to the out degree matrix, which is n minus 1 times identity, minus the adjacency. And after very simple manipulation, uh, you obtain that it's, it is equal to um, n times the identity minus the rank 1 matrix 1, uh, 1, one n transpose. And if you recall, in the previous chapter, we had also defined the projection matrix. This is the This is the orthogonal projection. Onto the space of vectors perpendicular to the span of one n. So these are all of the vectors that are perpendicular to one n. You project onto it and the Laplacian of the complete graph is just n times this, uh, this projection matrix. This is an undirected graph, and in, 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 indeed, this, this matrix, uh, uh, all of these matrices are, are symmetric. Now, let's draw some uh, preliminary observations about these matrices. The sign pattern of the matrix uh, of the Laplacian is, is important, and it's clear what it is. What it is is that on the main diagonal here, we have, uh, we have uh, positive or zero entries. And off, away from the main diagonal, the entries are either negative or zero. Hmm? This is the, the, the sign pattern of a Laplacian matrix. Um, the Laplacian matrix uh, depends on the graph. You give me the directed graph, I compute it. Once I have the Laplacian, um, so the Laplacian does not depend, does not depend upon uh, the existence and the values of self loops. So if you have a self loop in the, in the graph, it gets eliminated when the um, Laplacian is computed. So um, I'll, I'll come back to this in a, in a second. Clearly, if the graph is undirected, which is to say the adjacency matrix is symmetric, then L is symmetric. 
And by the way, this also means that d out is equal to d in and that, uh, 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 and that a is equal to a transpose. So there's some simplification in the, in the undirected case. And by the way, I, uh, in the previous, uh, in chapter four, we had characterized and said that an adjacency matrix uh, is irreducible um, when it cannot be, after a change of, uh, after permutation similarity transformation, cannot be written in block upper triangular form. So there was a definition of irreducibility for adjacency matrices that was independent of the graphs. Then there was a theorem that said that an adjacency matrix is irreducible if and only if the graph is strongly connected. So I'm going to use that concept. An adjacency matrix is irreducible if and only if the graph is strongly connected. I will use this concept to give a similar definition for Laplacians. So Laplacian matrix is said to be irreducible if the associated digraph is strongly connected. Let me let me take um, let me do a couple of, of simple of simple steps with these Laplacian matrices. Um, let's execute some very simple calculations to relate this new concept to concept we have seen in the previous uh, lecture. So imagine I take a vector x which lives in Rn. So what does that mean? That means that if you have an, a graph with uh, n nodes, the vector x living in Rn means that you have, you have essentially a value xi associated to each node. Now, you all remember the very simple matrix vector uh, operation, which is described in this box uh, here. So, and that is simply AX. So the ith entry of the, the vector AX is of the form sum uh, under J, of AIJ. Perfect. Next, let us try to compute what this same quantity is when I apply the Laplacian L to the vector of quantities X. Let's do these calculations together uh, very simply. And how do they function? So you apply the formula and you get, you get this first expression. You break up the expression in the sum of two terms, the terms that are along the diagonal and the terms that are away from the diagonal. Now you are ready to plug in the expression for, for L because two slides ago, we wrote the formula for Li i Lii was the sum of Aij where J was not equal to I and the formula for Lij when J is different from I which is minus Aij. After you've done that the next steps are elementary. You, collect, you notice that these two sums are executed over the same collection of indices therefore you can put it together and, and write Xi minus Xj. So in this first expression that you see here, you already see that the, um, the, the Laplacian matrix is singling out, is, is pulling out the pairwise differences between the values x of x associated with the nodes. Now I can um, further simplify or in any case just write an equivalent expression. Remember j belonging to n out means these are the set of neighbors of node i. For the case where the uh, graph has no self loops um, and I can just simply define the weighted the out degree to be the sum of all of the outgoing uh, edges and let us assume that each of the nodes has a strictly positive, at, at least one outgoing edge. So there are no sinks in the graph. There's at least one, one outgoing edge. Then what, what can we do? Well, one thing we can notice is that if you take the weight ij and divide it by d out of node i, that's a collection of coefficients because those are, if I am node i and I have a few outgoing edges, I can compute the total weight of all of the outgoing edges and then normalize the weight on each edge by that quantity. Now, of course, after I've normalized, the sum of the normalized uh, weights is one. So these coefficients here are, are convex combination coefficients and they do define a weighted averaging operation. And so it is easy and possible to rewrite uh, this equation 6.3 and say, well, the Laplacian, the ith entry of Lx, Laplacian applied to x, is equal to, well, the, the total out degree of node i 
and then I compare xi with the weighted average of all of its uh, out neighbors, of all of its out neighbors. If, if the weights are equal, are, are all equal, remember we used, we last lecture we also looked at the equal neighbor model. In that case, if the weights are all equal, let's say they're unit weights for a second, then you're actually just comparing, uh, if you know the i and you wish to compute lxi, you're just comparing your, your value with the value of the average of all of your out neighbors. Okay, so it's a bottom line LX is a sum of, um, each entry of LX is a sum of pairwise differences. The next quantity that I wish to work with is um, the, the quadratic form associated to L, which is the function of X, X transpose LX. Remember that's a quadratic form. And remember that when you, when you look at the quantity of the form X transpose LX, the matrix can should be should be assumed to be symmetric. If it's not symmetric, then you can just uh, you can just take its symmetric part. So this formula uh, that I'm about to obtain, let's restrict our attention to the setting of symmetric graphs for simplicity. So now here, there's a few simple derivation, and in the end, we're going to obtain a very nice a very nice expression for this quadratic form. So let's uh, bear with me and see. How these calculations works out. So first of all we're going to apply xi to the quantity that we computed in the previous slide and then we're going to expand the expression that we, we have obtained from the previous slide um, and in the end we, we get to a formula here let, let me let me clarify which one I am at right now here it is uh, where I am summing aij xi times xi minus xj so that formula is not symmetric in i and j, and that's what we want to uh, uh, to eliminate. We want to do some uh, clever reshuffling of terms in such a way that the ultimate expression is symmetric in these indices i and j. So how do we how do we achieve that? Well, here is the the trick: you um, um, multiply x i x j and and put that as one of the terms. The other term is a term of the form xi square, but and you have one copy of the term with xi square, so I will write that one copy as the sum of a term multiplied by one half and another sum of another term equal to one half. Now, what happens? This is a summation in uh, ij, both i and j going from one to n, but the the only index that appears is i. So now, because the coefficients a, i, j are equal to a, j, i, because of the symmetry, then it turns out that of these, of these two copies multiplied by one half, I'm going to rewrite one still in the variable x, i. The other, I will write it in the variable x, j, because it's as if I had changed the variable from i and j, but they're both summing from one to n, and a, j, i is equal to a, i, j. So we are, we are using symmetry. And now finally, finally, what, what do I have? I have I have three sums over the same indices of the same AIJ coefficients. And then I am summing XI square plus XJ square plus twice XI XJ. I, I say twice because really there is a factor of one half pre-multiplying all of this. And now that's a perfect square. So I have basically, with this trick based on symmetry, I have summed the square and I have obtained here a formula which um, entails the one half, the sum over all indices a, i, j, of all indices i and j, of the coefficient a, i, j multiplying x, i minus x, j squared. So basically here I have I have a sum of x i minus x j squared weighted by the edge. Now remember, we actually saw this. We actually saw this in the previous uh, chapter. Before I get there, let me let me just give it a name. So we're going to call this this function of x. We're going to call it the Laplacian potential function for reasons that is going to become apparent in the next two slides. The Laplacian potential function. Um, and notice that in the previous uh, chapter, we had defined a, something called a quadratic disagreement function of x, which was equal to, it was normalized by one over n, uh, equal to x i minus x j squared. So we're very close to, to that here. 
And what, what really is the truth is that with all of the correct scaling, that, that our um, um, Laplacian potential for the complete graph is a, just a scalar multiple of the quadratic disagreement function that we defined in the previous chapter. Hmm? Right, so the quadratic disagreement function is a Laplacian function when the matrix corresponds to the, um, when the graph is the complete graph, undirected graph, or, or another way to put it, the, the matrix is the, is the, the Laplacian matrix uh, is equal to the n copies of, uh, of uh, the orthogonal projection matrix by n. All right, we've seen two examples of the Laplacian matrix. We've seen some preliminary properties. We've seen some useful calculations. Let me apply these calculations on, some, on two examples that are familiar to the mechanical and the electrical engineers in the audience. Imagine that I begin by considering a spring network. So in other words, the collection of rigid bodies interconnected by spring. And for simplicity, and also because I want to maintain linearity of the problem, <coughs> Let's imagine that these are all moving on a line at this moment in time, and xi denotes the position of the if body on this line. Now, um, I'm assuming each spring is li ideal, linear, elastic, and I let aij denote the spring constant, which is to say also, it's also referred to as the stiffness of the spring between bodies, rigid body i and j. So, in right, in mechanical engineering, the the characteristic uh, uh, quantity describing a spring is called the stiffness of the spring. So now accordingly, I can now write what is the um, total force uh, exerted well, that body number i is perceiving. So the total force exerted on body i, and it depends upon how many other, how many other objects node i is connected. So it's the sum over all j of aij, the stiffness coefficient, which multiplies. Now, if xj is larger than xi, then the body i receives a positive force. If xj is negative, you receive a negative force. What that means is that we get a minus sign, which multiplies the Laplacian matrix. Now, the Laplacian matrix, I will use the subscript stiffness, because here, the Laplacian is really encoding the stiffness of the edges, the, and the edges the edges being the springs here. And so for those of you who have ever executed an exercise on, on spring networks with uh, rigid bodies interconnected by spring, at some point or another by hand, you, you were computing a Laplacian matrix, a stiffness matrix. In fact, in this, in, in, there are literature where this is exactly referred to as the stiffness matrix, and, and it is, well, minus a Laplacian matrix. Now, um, well, I, I didn't say it right. The, the Laplacian matrix is still the stiffness matrix, except that the way in which the force appears with the minus sign. So now, the similarly, I'll just let you read here and, and think about it. And the, the elastic energy stored in the spring network is exactly, modular constant, exactly the stiffness uh, 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 Laplacian matrix that I just introduced. So it's a quadratic form associated to the stiffness Laplacian. So that's wonderful. Here's another example that comes from uh, um, electric circuits. And here I'm imagining that I have an ideal circuit without capacitor capacitors or uh, inductors, just a purely resistive circuit with a pure current source that injects current into the uh, uh, grid, into the network, and, and uh, a, an output there where the current uh, is dumped to ground. So, um, I'm assuming that each edge is a resistor with the resistance Rij, and that's the resistance that connects nodes I to J. And so this is an undirected graph again, just like in the previous mechanical example, because, um, because the behavior of a resistance is, is symmetric. It doesn't matter uh, you know, whether the current is flowing left, right to left or left to right. And the same was true of the springs in the previous example. The spring exerts equal and opposite forces on the two objects to which it is connected. Um, now, 
for for those of you who are familiar with circuit the basics of circuit theory ohm's law will tell us what is the current flowing from i to j so it's important to understand that here you need to select an orientation of the edge to be able to measure the current along that edge you need to tell me whether it is a current whether it is a positive or negative current from i to j from somewhere to somewhere else anyway this current from i to j is equal is known to be equal to uh, uh, the one over the, the resistance of the edge which multiplies the difference of, of voltage at the two nodes because i have one over rij which i don't enjoy i prefer to work with with, with factors not with you know the divisions there so i will define here a i j to be one over r i j so the inverse resistance also called the conductance of the line and of course then a i j is zero when the resistance is infinity which means there essentially is no resistance no connection between between the two nodes when you put all of this together after simple manipulations you will see that if at this node i i have some current injected the current injected at i is the sum of all of the injections from from um well, sorry, whatever current gets injected at I because of conservation law, current, Kirchhoff current law, this current must go to all neighbors J. It cannot be stored. Here, there's no storage. And so the current injected at I must flow to all J's connected to I. And so the current injected must satisfy this equation. You look at it again and you realize that that equation is a sum of scalars multiplying pairwise differences and so in the vector form we have just now seen that the injected current at each node is equal to the matrix called the conductance matrix that multiplies the voltage vector at the nodes and so here the conductance matrix is again a Laplacian matrix similarly um, uh, working through the power dissipating on the resistor you will be able to see that this is a quadratic form and it's a quadratic form defined by the conductance matrix so it's exactly the Laplacian potential that I described three slides ago all right at this point I am ready to uh, move on and talk about uh, the properties, particularly the spectral properties of the Laplacian matrix. What properties does my Laplacian matrix have? And these are relatively easy properties because they are generalizations and modifications of the properties of the of adjacency matrices that we have already seen. So first of all, recall that maybe I'll write here on the right what the corresponding property for my row stochastic matrices was, and it was that it, the row sums were equal to zero. In this case, what happens is that the property is that the row sums of the Laplacians are equal to zero, not to one any longer, as they were for a row stochastic matrix. And the, the proof is, is elementary. I will let you read it here. There's a couple of calculations. Actually, here's an elegant one. You can look at it in vector form. L1 is, well, D out 1 minus A1, because L is equal to D out minus A. But D out 1 is the column of out degree vectors and a1n is the column of out degree vectors so of course they, they sum to zero let me let me add another comment when i write this equation when i say the row sums of l are zero that means that zero is an eigenvalue of l with the right eigenvector 1n and and again because of similarity with uh, with the theory of uh, adjacency matrices i will and perron frobenius theory i'll refer to the eigenvalue zero as the dominant eigenvalue now here's another, before we continue with the properties, here's just one little, one little point. So if I have a graph, I can, I can associate, I can go from a graph to a Laplacian. So I can always go from a graph to a Laplacian, a weighted directed graph to a Laplacian. Can you go backward? Is it true that if you look at the, at the matrix, you can say that there is a graph associated with it? And the answer is, well, yes, you can, but just with one, one, one clarification so it is possible to to take a matrix and call it laplacian if it has three properties the row sums are zero that's the property that we just saw the non-diagonal entries are zero or negative and the diagonal entries are zero or positive so this is the path the sign pattern that we talked about earlier where we have zeros 
no, pardon me, where we have positives or zero. Let me just write plus, and I mean to say plus or minus, and only minuses of the diagonal. And this is supposed to be a square matrix, so this I need to draw in a more elegant manner as a square. Now, if you, if you do it like this, it's always possible, given a Laplace matrix, to go back and define a graph, a graph that would have edges wherever a given ent any entry is, is non-zero, and the weight on the edges would be minus the weights on the, on the Laplace matrix. However, one thing, one thing is true that if you start with a graph that has self-loops with given weights, after you define the matrix and you come back to the graph, you have now lost that information. So in other words, the Laplace, any matrix L that satisfies these three properties, and it's therefore going to be called the Laplace matrix, does induce a weighted digraph. However, this digraph will be without self-loops always. It's always without self-loops. With this definition, it is true that if I have a Laplace matrix, I can define a graph, and the Laplace matrix of that graph is the matrix that I started with. Here's another property. I am interested in knowing when is it true that I am, I am interested. We will be interested. We will see that it's useful. When is it true that also the column sums vanish are equal to zero? And that if and only if is, is given by the property that the graph is weight balanced, which means that in and out degree matrices are equal. So for each node, at each node, the sum of the weights of the incoming uh, edges is equal to the sum of the weights of the outgoing edges. This is going to be, therefore, the, the degree of the node. Notice that I'm not requiring the graph to be regular, which would mean that every node has exactly the same degree. Hmm? So the degree of the nodes, the degrees of the nodes can well be different. And uh, the proof is just two lines here. I will let you, I will let you see that. It's, uh, it's uh, just a simple manipulation. Finally, let me apply the Gersh-Goring disk theorem to, to a Laplace matrix. What happens? Let's remember one more time. A Laplace matrix has this sign pattern where I have pluses or zero on the main diagonal and then negatives on the off diagonal. And it has the property that L1n is equal to 0n. Remember, the Gersh-Goring disks are the union of points z on the complex plane such that compute the it's a disk centered at LII, at the ith entry, diagonal entry of L, which is positive. So we already know that if I were to take all of the positive entries in my matrix, I could put them on the positive, uh, on the positive semi-axis, right? Horizontal semi-axis. So it, they, they must be there because maybe possibly zero, because we know that LII has to be greater than or equal to zero. Additionally, what else do we know? The gersh -Gorin, the radius of the gersh goring disk is the sum of the absolute value of the off-diagonal entries in the same row of the in, of LII. So these are the row gersh goring disks that I am referring to. And all right, so what do we know about those coefficients? What the sum of the absolute value of Lij. Well, we know that, first of all, all those numbers are negative, so this is really equal to minus the sum of Lij. This is for j different from i. And we know that when we sum the number Lii, we get zero, which means that this is exactly equal to Lii. Perfect. Now, what that means is that if I, if I go to the point LII here in my picture, right here, and I draw a radius, I draw a segment of the same length of my distance to the origin, so these two lengths are equal, lengths are equal, and are equal to LII, then the gersh goring disk for the ith row will be precisely this disk. It's the disk centered at LII of radius LII. So the gersh goring row disks are very simple to work with. I have drawn three such disks here, the i, i, j, j, k, k. For any index i running from 1 through n, you get a disk. But all of these disks have the following two properties. They are tangent to the imaginary axis at the origin, 
and their, their center is on the positive or non-negative real axis. So now, for example, it's also obvious to make the following comment. Imagine that I let L max denote the maximum value of L1 all the way through Ln, the largest entry on the diagonal of the Laplacian. Then it is true that I can, I can draw, I can pick that point. This distance here is L max. It's a long distance. Now I need to go up the same amount here. So I'm really far away, relatively large value. Now I'm going to ruin my beautiful picture, but hopefully you can still understand. And now I need to draw a disc that is that large and that goes all around. And now, and now I know that all of the eigenvalues of the Gersh scoring of, of the Laplace matrix live inside this largest possible disk. So what does the lemma say, bottom line? If you give me any weighted diagram with the Laplacian, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, it's either, either equal to zero because it's entirely possible that you, that you are at zero. These, these disks are touching zero or they have strictly positive real part. In fact, even more is known, it's known that they're inside these disks of radius L max. But for sure, this disk L max contains the origin and only point with strictly positive real part. This is useful. This is very useful. However, I will be interested in, in establishing a little bit more, just like we did in chapter two, we use the gersh gorin disks to get s s theorem to get some preliminary ideas about about a one n equal to one n. We ended up being able to say that rho of a is equal to one, but we wanted to know more. We wanted to know more information about the other eigenvalues. Here we're in a similar situation because we have l one n equal to zero n. So we know that zero is an eigenvalue belongs to the spectrum of l. And we know that the other eigenvalues are possibly, have possibly strictly positive real part, but we don't know. Maybe they're all zero. We want to know more about what the spectrum are. And so how many, what is this, what is the multiplicity of the eigenvalue zero? What is it? And how, you know, how, what, what else can we say? Essentially using, this is going to be what I'm about to state is a consequence of the peron frobenius theorem as applied to Laplacian matrices, essentially. And the answer is the following. Remember, if I have a graph, a directed graph, I can associate to it the condensation diagraph. And the condensation diagraph has a certain number of sinks because it's a directed acyclic graph. So the condensation of a diagraph, G, I denoted it by C of G, is a, di a directed acyclic graph. It has at least one sink, could have more. And let n sub s, with the obvious meaning, s stands for sink, the number of such sinks. Well, then the, the eigenvalue of the Laplacian equal to zero is always semi-simple with multiplicity equal to the number of sinks of the graph. So if you have, if you have a graph that has globally reachable nodes, then from every node there is a path that goes to one globally reachable node. That globally reachable node must be in the sink of the condensation and the condensation has only one sink. And this is the next thing I'm going to say here. The second part of this theorem is that if, if um, the following three statements are equivalent. The eigenvalue zero is simple, so geometric and algebraic multiplicity equal to one, if and only if the graph contains a globally reachable node. And if that's the case, then when zero is a simple eigenvalue, that means all of the other eigenvalue, all of the other n minus one eigenvalues are non-zero. Therefore, the rank of the Laplacian is n minus one, which which essentially now this really is telling us that again, if I go back to my to my complex plane. Uh, for the Laplacian matrix uh, that, that we are interested in. And if I, uh, if I draw a circle, uh, uh, this is the largest circle that I talked about earlier. Now we know 
that one eigenvalue is identically equal to zero. Let's say we put ourselves in this case where the, there is a global initiable node and therefore the condensation digraph has a unique sink. Then I know that all of the other eigenvalues are uh, strict, containing in strictly to the right of the eigenvalue equal to zero. Therefore, they all have strictly positive real part. Strictly positive real part. Now, the proof of this exercise, of this theorem, um, I want to not do the proof, but I want to show you, um, I want to show you a quick, a quick thing that is interesting. Um, Oops, sorry. Um, how do we go about doing this proof? And the proof is based upon this exercise, which is a fun exercise and you should perhaps uh, consider doing. Here's the point. I have a Laplace matrix and I want to study some properties of it, but I, I know properties of non-negative matrices, which are essentially adjacency matrices. So how do I go back from a Laplace all the way to an adjacency matrix? And here's, a, here's one way to do that. Pick again, L max is the largest of the diagonal entries of the Laplacian, and pick an epsilon that is smaller than one over L max. A sufficiently small epsilon easily exists because L max uh, is positive. If L max is zero, the entire matrix is zero, so it's not a very interesting case. Then define a, 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 <coughs> a matrix, script A, I'll refer to it, sub L, also function of epsilon, to be the identity matrix minus epsilon L. So remember, L has diagonal entries which are, which, are, which are positive, of diagonal entries which are negative. Now, when I multiply L by minus epsilon, I obtain a matrix which has positive or zero entries outside the diagonal and negative entries on the main diagonal. But these negative entries are small in magnitude. They're all less than one because the largest of them in magnitude was L max, and now I'm multiplying by epsilon, which is less than one over L max. So therefore, therefore all of these um, uh, diagonal entries are less than one. Perfect. So now this means that A is greater than or equal to zero because the off diagonal entries are positive and the diagonal entries is one minus a number less than one. Now I can think of that as a, as a non-negative matrix, which is an adjacency matrix. And then what this exercise asks you to do it asks you to, to verify lots of very clean, nice correspondences between, between uh, L and A sub L. First of all, you can check AL is row stochastic and is strictly positive diagonal. The graph associated to A has all of the same edges as in L, as in the graph associated to L. A sub L is double stochastic if and only if G sub L is weight balanced, which means that L is... Um, has zero column sums, as we saw earlier. Uh, a is, is a primitive matrix if and only if GL is strongly connected. And if you have eigenpair for A, now you also immediately can compute eigenpair of L. So really, uh, that theorem I showed you earlier about where are the eigenvalues of L is an immediate consequence of all the theorems we've studied for, uh, for GCC matrices. As soon as you construct this, uh, this uh, correspondence here, that uh, that I am highlighting at this moment in time, right there, you you go back from L to A, you establish the property for A, and then you map it onto the properties for L. And that's why the proof of this theorem six point six is the final spectral property of the Laplacian, and the proof is immediate. It's just three lines because it just tells you go compute the associated uh, adjacency matrix A sub L, which plays the role of an adjacency matrix and, and study properties of that. Perfect. At this point in time, we are ready to uh, study uh, the third section of this chapter. So in the first two sections, we have defined the Laplacian, seen some useful calculation, we've seen some interesting mechanical and electrical examples, and then in section two, we've reviewed some, some properties. The row sums are zero, the column sums are zero if and only if the associated graph is weight balanced, 
we've seen you can define matrices independently of graphs and, and find out what that means for them to be Laplacians. And we've, we've seen where the eigenvalues are, first through Gershgorin, and then essentially using properties of the adjacency matrices, which means using Perron Frobenius. Now, let us study in this section the case of symmetric graphs or undirected graphs or symmetric adjacency matrices. What that means, of course, is that you know L will be will be symmetric. So we have symmetric Laplaces. By the way, that was the case in both the electric and the mechanical example I presented. Now, what happens? What what happens is this: we've already seen. Let me draw the picture again. We've just seen that um, all eigenvalues of the Laplacian are contained in a in a disk. That touches the that touches the vertical axis, right at the right point. There it is. One eigenvalue we know for sure is equal to zero. The others, for an asymmetric Laplacian, could be complex conjugate. But now here we know that they have to be real because L is symmetric. And so here's what we know: we know that all eigenvalues are real. At least one is zero. And all the others are not negative, so you could have other ones here. They cannot be too large, and they cannot be negative. So now, by convention, well, there is a natural order between them, and it is convenient by convention to order them in increasing magnitude. So the, the inequalities here are left to right. So what have I written? I have written that lambda 1 is always 0, because we know L1 is 0. We know L1n. Is zero n. So, so we know that lambda is, you can think of this as lambda one times zero n. Then we have another n minus one eigenvalues, and the smallest of which is lambda two. So the smallest eigenvalue that has a as a shot at being non-zero is lambda two. It could still be zero, because if I have a graph that is undirected graph that is disconnected, then the condensation of that graph would have two things. So the graph could have two connected components then we know that the eigenvalue 0 is semi-simple with multiplicity 2. So even lambda 2 would be 0, and then it would be probably lambda 3, or possibly lambda 3 that would be strictly positive. Now, so lambda 2 is an important quantity. It's called the algebraic connectivity of the graph. So it's the second smallest eigenvalue of a symmetric Laplacian, uh, and it's, right, and it's, it's called algebraic connectivity. Um, and in honor of the uh, scientists who, who study them first, these are oftentimes referred to as the Fiedler eigenvalue. This is referred to as the Fiedler eigenvalue and its eigenvector, which, which, is, which is unique after you rescale it to sum to one, and it's the right and left eigenvector are the same because the matrix is symmetric. It's referred to as the Fiedler eigenvector. And these are relatively recent uh, constructions as of the early uh, 70s. All right. So now, um, what do we know? What do we know about lambda two? Well, based on the theorems that we've already applied, the corollary and immediate application is that the graph is connected if and only if lambda two is strictly positive. And also, the multiplicity of zero as a semi-simple eigenvalue of L is equal to the number of connected components of G. So if you have a graph and it's connected, you know lambda two is positive. That's why lambda two is called algebraic connectivity because the more the, the graph has to be connected, otherwise lambda 2 is 0, and then, then we will now see what does it mean for a graph to be more algebraically connected than, than before. And here I have one alternative definition of lambda 2, which is the variational description of lambda 2. Basically, lambda 2 can be written as a solution of an optimization problem, which starts to look similar to when we were talking about ergodicity coefficients. So here you're looking at all vector x's in Rn. Let me, let me amplify this. All vector x's in Rn that have unit norm and they're perpendicular to the vector of 1, so they have zero mean, essentially. <coughs> and you look at the, you're looking at the smallest value that the quadratic form, the potential Laplacian, uh, can take. So the minimum over all such x's. And it turns out that that's lambda 2. So this is the variational description. And it is a consequence of the variational description of eigenvalues for symmetric matrices. Uh, it's a consequence of something called the Kura-Fisher theorem or the mean-max theorem. 
I will, I will uh, um, uh, leave it as an exercise so that you can follow up on this uh, and study that. It's a bit outside of the scope, but there is a variational representation. And if, if you look at this variational representation, you, you can begin to realize that L, um, if, you increase, if you increase L in some sense, lambda 2 can only increase. And, and this is the exact sense in which that makes uh, that is reasonable. And it's the monotonicity property that I am showing here. So what does this monotonicity property say? It says that if you have a graph and it has certain edge weights, if you increase the edge weights, just like we did in, in lecture four, we were talking about the monotonicity of the spectral radius of an, of an GCC matrix. If I increase the edge weights by either adding a little bit of mass to each of the already existing edges or I add a new edge, then lambda 2 can only increase, hmm? can only increase. It's a, it's a monotonicity relationship. Now, here's yet another uh, uh, example, or yet another concept that we can review for the Laplacian as we define and already analyzed or discussed for undirected graphs. And that is the fact that there are basic uh, graphs, well known, and you know it's, it's always good to understand concepts with respect to the basic examples, the path graph, the cycle graph, the star graph, the complete and the complete bipartite. The pictures of these were in chapter three. And um, it's possible to compute for each of them the Laplacian spectrum, which is now a synonym for the spectrum of the Laplacian matrix. And, you know, here I have formulas for them. It's not so critical. But in this spectrum, and because these are all undirected, I'm especially interested in the La algebraic connectivity, which is given here. So what can, we, what can we learn now? Here's what we learn. If I have a complete graph, the um, algebraic connectivity is linearly growing in the size of the graph. The larger is the graph, the larger is the connectivity. If I have a star graph, one central node and all other nodes connected to the, to the center, the algebraic connectivity is a constant. It's just one, independent of n. On the other hand, if I have a path graph, a long path graph, or very similar to it, a cycle graph, where, which, is, which is like a path graph plus an extra edge, then the algebraic connectivity scales with one over n square with appropriate coefficients, which means that the larger is the, is the graph, so the longer is the path, um, the smaller is the algebraic connectivity. So this is telling you that a long graph is connected because the number is strictly positive, but the strength of the connection as measured by the algebraic connectivity is decaying as one over n squared. If you, if you had a complete graph, which has every possible edge, then the strength of the connectivity is actually growing instead of decreasing. Um, in the bipartite graph, it, uh, it grows with the smallest of the size of the two of the, two of the partition. Um, all right. So, so, all right, so this is, this is, I hope I have conveyed to you the intuition why uh, for, the, for the name, lambda 2 is called the algebraic connectivity. The more edges there are, the larger lambda 2 is, and then the more weights they have. Now, this now leads me to looking at a different problem. Here's a different problem unrelated to the spectral properties alone, and it's related to the eigenvectors as well of, of, the, of the Laplacian matrix. So, Laplacian systems are intuitively speaking related to equilibriums of compartmental flow systems, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We are now interested in equilibrium problems. Let me just describe these problems for you. Suppose that, as you've seen earlier in this chapter, I am given a spring network. And now my, my um, um, rigid bodies are subject to external forces. For example, a force going to the left of, of size minus, well, size three in magnitude, but minus three because it's oriented to the left, plus one and plus two. It is not a coincidence that I am assuming that the applied load, which I am using the symbol F load, has the property of having zero mean or equivalently zero sum or equivalently when you apply the vector one n is zero or equivalently f load is perpendicular to 1n 
Hmm? These are all equivalent sentences. Zero mean, zero sum, perpendicular to one end, it's all the same. I am hoping to find an equilibrium of, of my spring network. And that's why I can only apply a force with the property that the sum of all of the components is zero. And, and especially those of you who are familiar with, with mechanical system, clearly, if you're hoping to find for an equilibrium, you have to have that the resultant force is equal to zero. Otherwise, your mechanical system will accelerate because of the equation F equal to MA, and it will not have an equilibrium. Similarly, I want to go back to my electric circuit example and imagine that I inject, inject some current. For example, I'm injecting a negative one just because I wanted to clarify it doesn't have to be a positive current. Um, and somewhere else I inject a plus one current or, or, or here they're both, in any case, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that the sum of the injected currents is zero. Another synonym for, for these two properties that I've written here is, I will for now on say that F load is balanced. So it's a balanced injection of, of forces in the left and current on the right, meaning to say the sum of all the entries is zero. And I am hoping to find a, a, a collection of equilibrium voltages for the nodes on the circuit in such a way that uh, uh, all of Kirchhoff and, Volt, Kirchhoff and Ohm's laws are satisfied. So an exact solution to my physical systems. So what happens? What happens is that uh, using the derivations we had earlier in the chapter, we obtain that the equilibrium equation for the mechanical system is, is, uh, is given by L stiffness X equal to F load so X is the position. So I don't know the position of the uh, rigid masses in my mechanical spring network. And I don't know the voltages V, but I know that the voltages V need to satisfy the equation L voltage, sorry, L conductance times the voltages equal to injected current. So now both these equations are entirely analogous. Of course, they are asking you to solve a, a linear set of equation in uh, in your matrix theory class you may have looked at the problem of the form a x equal to b and said something like if a is invertible then x equal to a inverse b is a solution right the classic classic knowledge basic knowledge from matrix theory now here the the matrix is a laplacian matrix and the injection, the vector on the right is the injection. The B what's called the B vector is the, is the injection. And what we know, we know two things which make the problem a little more interesting than before. That L is not invertible. L has an eigenvalue equal to zero. So you have no hope of just writing L inverse. That would be inaccurate. And that's why it just so happens to be the case that in order to find a solution to these equations, you need to assume that the uh, load or injected currents are balanced because that means that you have a hope to find at least one solution. In fact, we will see that there is a family of solutions, right? So this is what I mean. It's just a little definition to fix the notation, fix the concept. A Laplacian system, I will mean to say a system, a static system of equation, like you would study in a standard matrix theory class of the form Lx equal to B. How can I compute all of the axes that satisfy this equation? And in order to do that, I need to, um, I need to um, define um, an object, which is the pseudo inverse operation, an, an operation of pseudo inverse. So the, um, the general definition of pseudo inverse is, uh, let me not go there and, sp and spend too much time defining it. Let me just mention that it's an, and it's an exercise in chapter two. And um, it's a unique matrix with certain basic properties, the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Um, and it's denoted by the symbol L pseudo inverse. And all that it boils down to in our case today is that it's the following. Suppose that I have a Laplacian matrix, which is symmetric. Therefore, I can diagonalize it 
by means of an orthogonal matrix U, and I will be able to write my Laplacian matrix I'll, as L equal to U, my ortho, orthonormal matrix. Orthonormal means that U, U transpose is equal to identity in dimension N. And it also means, by the way, that, um, no, let's just, let's just leave it at that. And, um, all right, let's come back to my Laplacian. The Laplacian is equal to U and then a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues of L and then U transpose. And these eigenvalues of L, we now know, of course, they're of the form zero comma lambda two all the way through lambda N. So I have a first formula to work with. And um, what am I interested in, in saying? Clearly, the first result of this lemma is that the image of L is one n perpendicular. So if you are trying to look at all of the vectors of the form Lx, they're all the sets of balanced vectors because, um, because of the form of L. And therefore, the system of equation Lx equal to b admits a solution if and only if the vector b belongs to the image of L, also the, the span of the columns of L, and that happens precisely when b is balanced, zero, zero sum. If I am balanced, so in other words, if I am zero sum, then all of the solutions to my, system, to my Laplacian system have to be of the form described in here. There is a particular solution and then a homogeneous solution. The homogeneous solution is a solution to this problem where the right hand side is zero. And so in other words, the solution to L x equal to zero, the collection of vector x where this is true, this is called the kernel of L and the kernel of L is precisely the span of one end because if you apply 1n to L, you obtain L1n, which is equal to 0n, as we've already seen several times in this chapter. So the homogeneous solution is a scalar multiple of any element in the kernel, and the specific solution is a solution that comes out of applying, not the inverse, because that's ill-defined, but the pseudo-inverse of L. And so in order to make sense of this, uh, of this uh, uh, set there, and particularly of L pseudo inverse B, I need to compute the pseudo inverse of L for you. And it's easy to compute when the matrix, the pseudo inverse of a matrix is easy to compute when the matrix is, in, is symmetric, because what happens is that L pseudo has the same eigenvectors as L, therefore it's diagonalized by exactly the same ortho, orthonormal matrix U, and as eigenvalues, it has, this, it has one over the same eigenvalues of L with the only exception of the first eigenvalue, which is equal to zero in both L and L pseudo inverse. So compare this, this equation here that I'm just showing to you right now with this, with this one here. They have the same U, only the eigenvalues have become reciprocal except for the first. And one can show that these properties of this uh, L pseudo inverse are remarkable. It has numerous properties. Um, it's a symmetric matrix, positive semi-definite, because one over lambda i is gonna be positive if lambda i is positive and zero remains zero. So it's clearly not positive definite, it is positive semi-definite. It happens to annihilate the vector one um, uh, just like L does. So L1n is zero, also L pseudo 1n is zero. And if you multiply L pseudo with pseudo L, L pseudo is equal to L pseudo L, and this is equal exactly to the orthogonal projection matrix that we've been observing uh, lately uh, pop up in numerous uh, um, points and places. So by the way, these properties here are precisely the ones that show that L is exactly the pseudo inverse. So if you go look at the definition of pseudo inverses, you will see these are the, the properties that, that are critical. All right, so this is giving you the full solution of, of any arbitrary um, Laplacian system when the graph is connected and lambda 2 is strictly positive. And it's L pseudo times the vector of injection, 
plus any object that lives in the kernel, any scalar multiple of the vector of ones. What does the scalar multiple of vector of ones, what's the interpretation, physically speaking, in our example? Well, clearly, if this is an equilibrium solution for the mechanical spring network, then any horizontal translation of it will also be an equilibrium. Similarly, in, in electrical engineering, you all well know that if I tell you a solution in terms of voltages for all of these nodes, also if I raise the voltage or lower the voltage, so it's only the voltage differences that matter in terms of determining the current that flows through the circuit, not the absolute value of the voltages, right? It's always a voltage difference, right? That's why you have this, this, this independence over this shift. Final example I want to show you of, of how the pseudo inverse appears. This is a especially interest to those of you who are uh, interested in electric circuits, so I'll, I'll be fast. Um, it turns out that uh, there is an elegant notion of effective resistance in, in a circuit. So if I give you a single two node and you put a resistor between them, then you can imagine that the resistance between these two nodes is the distance between them. But now if I embed these two nodes in a graph like that, as so, it turns out that yes, there is current that goes from the first to the second through the edge that connects them. But in reality, there is current that goes through pretty much every possible path all the way to the red node. And so the electrical distance decreases when these additional edges are added. And so how do we define this uh, electrical, uh, electrical distance? Well, it turns out that the distance between these two nodes uh, that I have just now here, I'm going to denote by I, well, no, actually, I apologize. I here and J there. How do I measure an effective re resistance between these two nodes when I apply a unit current that enters I and that comes out of J? And essentially, I have a problem. I have a very simple Laplacian problem for every pair. Uh, inject the current, um, define a vector that has plus one and minus one, plus one at the ith entry, and minus one at the jth entry, right? This is your current, this is your injection current, and try to solve the equation. So this is uh, this is the vector. I'm gonna call, I'm going to call E1 to be the, the basis vector of the natural basis of vectors in Rn. And similarly, Ei will be the vector which is zero everywhere with a one at the ith entry and zeros everywhere else. So now I have to solve the equation LV equal to EI minus EJ because that's that's in order to come we want and we want to write this as um, we're going to be interested in knowing the um, we're going to be interested in writing this as um, um, in any case the details are not critical right now I'll let you read this but we are going to be interested in, in understanding vi minus vj and so this equation implies that v is equal to l pseudo EI minus EJ uh, plus a homogeneous solution here that I'm not going to worry much about, but I am interested in defining RIJ efficient, uh, effective, which is just the, um, it's not the full vector V, it's just the ith vector, the ith entry minus the jth entry. So I need to multiply EI minus EJ transpose V, and that will give me exactly. EI minus EJ transpose L pseudo EI minus EJ. And so that's the formula 6.9 that I have obtained here with a little bit of, uh, of drama <laughs> and complexity. Uh, but no worry, it's very elementary. And um, from this formula, you obtain your effective resistance. As you see, the effective resistance is very, very closely related to the pseudo inverse uh, matrix of the Laplacian. And um, and um, by the way, of course, uh, EI transpose minus EJ transpose uh, 
of the vector of one ends is zero, so that, that, that extra term will go to zero. Um, that's why this is the right moment to talk about this effective resistance. And it's very useful in a number of applications. It's, a, it's almost like a, a network science slash electrical engineering uh, uh, quantity. And what, what happens is that the resistance distance is a distance function on the graph. What do I mean by that? It's any function that is non-negative between any two nodes, and it's equal to zero only precisely when the two nodes are the same. <coughs> it's symmetric in the two nodes, and it's sub-additive. So if I go from I to J, that is shorter than going from I to K and from K to J. So the effective resistance IJ is less than RIK plus RKJ. Finally, also very elegant, well-known, widely studied in circuit theory all the way back to the 1800, 1800, um, late 1800, Rayleigh proved yet another monotonicity property. They're all of the same style. As you increase the weights in the graph, you add a little bit of mass on some of the edges or you create new edges. The effective resistance can only decrease because it's when you have extra edges, it's easier to carry current. So I know you were expecting it greater than or equal to. The conductance is increasing, but this is now the effective resistance. So that is decreasing. All right. So this is a very nifty set of concepts and they, they can come in, in handy. All right, I'm finally able to uh, give you a glimpse into the two appendices uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter. So I'll do that uh, quickly um, and I'll be happy to discuss this in person. Uh, the chapters are there. There's more information about this in the, on the web, of course, and so on and so forth. So if you are a network scientist, one of your interests is that of finding a way of partitioning the graph into two or more, let's say two for now, two distinct communities with the property you want the communities to be tightly connected inside among the individuals inside the community and only weakly connected across the cut. And so it's very natural to say, hey, uh, I wish to define the size of the cut as the sum of the weights that cross from one partition to the other. I should say, from one element of the partition V1 into the other element of the partition, that is the set V2. Now, we would like to compute the minimum cut. That's, a, that's a, a, um, an interesting problem. Um, and it's combinatorially and computationally hard. And so one thing you can do is you can use the Laplacian potential as an approximation for the cut. So let me show you what I mean. So if you define well, this is a, just a scaled version by one fourth, but let's not worry. The potential, the Laplacian potential, and you were to minimize it over binary axes, where you where you say each x is either plus one or minus one. Remember, x is a vector in Rn, and so if I in general, in this case, I am going to select x to be into minus one plus one to the n, and so now in the end, if I can minimize that function, I'm going to end up with a vector which which will contain plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, explaining to which of the two of the two partitions, V1 over V2, the node belongs. Now, of course, in this minimization, I need to subtract the, the vectors minus one n and one n because otherwise that there will be selected as the minimum. Now, this optimization is entirely identical to the one before. So I have not gained anything other than what I'm going to do now is I will relax the problem and instead of using only binary things, I will use continuous things. So I will actually aim to solve this equation here where I am looking for, for a y which, uh, which um, is perpendicular to one n, but th that is allowed to take values in all of our n. And now very simple uh, thinking here leads to the fact that the solution to this problem is precisely the, um, the eigenvector uh, V2 associated to lambda 2, which we refer to as the Fiddler eigenvector. So now I need to take the Fiddler eigenvector and quantize it. 
every time the entry of the Fiedler eigenvector is greater than zero, I map it to plus one. If it's negative, less than zero, I map it to minus one. When you use this very naive heuristic, this is a very neat illustration due to Gleich. I am here providing you a, a noisy measurement of a matrix A with some zeros, and it's very hard for us to detect anything. However, if you look at the entries of this V2 eigenvector, you can see that after you know, proper calculation, many of them, like about half of them are negative and the other half are positive. If you use this community detection idea, uh, heuristic, so look at the entries of V2 and split the graph in two and then renumber the nodes so that every node that belongs to the first component comes first and the nodes that belong to the second component comes second, then after this uh, permutation transformation, A looks like that. And as you see, A looks like every one of the first 550 nodes have really strong uh, connection among all of the others in there. And so is true for the second cluster. So this, we have really been able to detect the two communities in this example. Finally, here is another appendix with an example designed for the control theoreticians amongst you. So this is a, a nice example. I have, I have clocks, I have multiple clocks, and the clocks are integrating, uh, they're, they're measuring time. And what that means is that essentially the, the measure they offer to you is, uh, the measure they offer to you is the measure they, that they thought time was at, at the last instant, plus the speed at which, how much does it take them to, 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 to measure, let's say, a unit of time, let's say one minute. So there's a DI here. So this DI is the speed, the clock speed or the skew. And of course, the clocks are not synchronized at time zero, so they have their own initial offset, initial value. And so the entire network of clocks obeys a very simple equation. Each clock is adding to its own uh, um, value uh, its speed. Hmm? We want to synchronize them. If we don't synchronize them, what happens, as illustrated here, is that Perhaps di, the speed of clock i, is larger than dj. Maybe even xi just so happens to be larger than xj, so the initial offset. And now you see that these two clocks are actually uh, integrating time at a different speed. So one would say that one is faster and the other one is slower, and the, the, the distance between them is actually increasing with time. I don't want that distance to increase. I want that distance to decrease. I want that distance to go to zero. That's what it means for me to clock synchronize, the clock synchronization problem. How do I solve, how do I achieve this task? Well, I have added the control signal there and now your design task is synthesize a controller that measuring only local information, which is to say the value of the node i and maybe the value of time at the nearby clocks according to some graph design a controller that synchronizes all of the clocks. Now, in this appendix, I will let you read, but we propose two, the, two algorithms are proposed. One is a proportional controller, which is based upon averaging. So I'm averaging the errors between me and my neighbors with some weights, and that's the controller that I use. What's elegant is that this is corresponding to the use of a certain Laplacian matrix. And one can see that the error system that one obtains is precisely an affine averaging system as I reviewed in one of the exercises in chapter two. So I will refer you to that exercise. And when you have an affine averaging system, the solution does not go to zero or, or actually it's not true that it goes to synchrony but rather it's true that the clocks asymptotically reach a steady state distance difference between them. So there is, a, there is an error. The error does not increase, but it doesn't go to zero either. So if I come back here in this picture, you saw that the error was even increasing with time, right? This is, this is smaller at the beginning. As time progresses, the error is widening out. With the proportional controller, you speed up or slow down the clock based upon the, the distance to its neighbors. You can achieve that the error system goes to a constant steady state value, but non-zero. Now, 
every one of you in the audience as a control person should remember that if you have a steady state error a classical way of improving your control design is to add an integral control action hmm, with the corresponding gain now again it's an averaging based proportional integral action now you have a controller but it depends upon a state of the controller which is integrating the error and interestingly we end up with the matrix that is 2n times 2n and and now in this matrix there are laplacian matrices and so now using the properties of laplacian matrices as exposed in this chapter one can show that indeed this controller achieves asymptotic clock synchronization and to be more precise it does so whenever the gains of the proportional action and the gain of the integral action satisfy certain constraints so for certain ranges i will let you read the details and if you have a chance to study also the proof you will see how all of the properties we have seen so far come come nicely into play all right so there's also a beautiful little bit of history here that you can review at, at your leisure in summary in conclusion we've seen in this chapter how to take properties of the adjacency matrix and um, define a, a second a distinct matrix associated to the graph that's called the laplacian matrix in many problems it is natural many problems naturally offer you the uh, adjacency matrix in many other problems the matrix that is very natural is the laplacian matrix it just comes out of the data of the problem and and so therefore it's important to understand the properties of this of this matrix and we have understood many of them especially the spectral properties about where are the eigenvalues and something about the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. We have treated first the general case of an asymmetric Laplacian. And then we've seen how much richer and powerful and applicable is the theory when it comes to symmetric Laplacians. And we've, we've thought about this way of measuring connectivity through Lambda 2. We've, we've solved this uh, uh, Laplacian systems problem. It's a static equilibrium problem. We've seen a notion of distance that is relevant in, in circuit problems and, and, and so forth. And then for those of you interested in it, um, as I said, I have included an, a network science appendix of community detection and the control engineering appendix on PI control design for clock synchronization. Uh, thank you all for all of your attention. If you've reached the, all the way to here, uh, thank you. Pretty exciting to have you with me. And uh, this is the end of chapter six, and I will see you in the future for chapter seven.